everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Mission Critical in Divorce, 10 Key Insights in 60 Minutes, a free AAML BVR virtual divorce conference preview. I'm happy to welcome uh, everyone to today's event, and I'm honored to introduce the best and brightest in the world of divorce. Today we'll hear from just 10 of our presenters who will each give a valuable insight and tip from their presentation, and I can assure you their full events will be just as packed with takeaways. My name is Jared Waters, and I'm the training director at BVR. And I'd like to just jump into it because we have uh, a full panel of speakers. So first off, we have top tax and business valuation settlement strategies in the COVID-19 era. Uh, this session is by Michelle Gallagher, who is a co-chair of the session. All right, that's to you, Michelle. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are today. I am very excited to be sharing with you the top tax and business valuation settlement strategies in this COVID-19 era. My name is Michelle Gallagher. I am a CPA, accredited in business valuation and certified in financial forensics. I do expert witness work on the financial side with Adam Evaluation. We're based in Michigan and we do work throughout the Midwest and throughout the country. So, I am excited to share with you just a few hot tips on some settlement strategies that our group has been seeing over the last not only few months in the COVID era, but I'm also going to reach back a little bit and share with you what's been happening a little bit since the change in the tax code with the alimony changes and what we're seeing in some settlement strategies there. So let's get right into the alimony alternatives, these are not necessarily new or different with COVID, but certainly something we wanted to share and just keep at the top of people's minds. Some of these will come into play and we'll talk about in a little bit when it comes to the retirement plans because there have been changes in that arena with the latest CARES Act and, and a number of new federal tax acts that came into play this year. So real quick, again, this is a hot tips, supposed to be pretty fast. I would definitely encourage you to join us for our deeper dive into some of these items in our Sum It Up sessions that relate to business valuation as well as other financial considerations happening in today's environment. So to kick it off, our alimony alternatives, for the most part, we all know that the alimony, everybody thought the sky was going to be falling when it was no longer tax deductible or tax includable for the parties. However, some people have been very creative since this new law came into play a couple of years ago. Primarily, the alternatives that we've been seeing all relate to income shifting and just trying to shift the income to the lower tax payer or the lower tax rate taxpayer. So retirement funds are a great way to do that. That happens in almost every divorce case. So you don't even need a business per se to, to have to look at this idea. But instead of splitting a retirement plan 50-50, you may want to give more to the uh, spouse who would otherwise be receiving the alimony. Uh, just a quick reminder, we can use uh, quadros and you can also, if you do a very large disproportionate allocation of retirement funds, there are some vehicles to replenish those very large discrepancy in the allocations. And again, we'll, we'll cover those in more detail. I am also going to cover in a minute the SECURE Act hardship withdrawals and the ability to take out some retirement plan money right now without penalty and with a multiple year alternatives. Another great idea if you've got some rental real estate or income producing real estate is to transfer more of those assets to the otherwise alimony recipient, as well as investment accounts or specifically investments that have higher capital gains embedded in them. Now, in today's COVID world, uh, maybe now, the, as the market continues to rebound, this is this is back on the table. But of course, a couple months ago, we were looking at not many gains. But this is a, a another area to watch and, and be able to maybe give a little more of those assets to the otherwise 
alimony recipient. If you do have a company and you have some issues with potentially liquidity or taxing of how to deal with getting some money out to the out spouse or the, the alimony recipient, there are some alternatives and options in doing some redemptions of stock within companies. So those are some great alternatives that have been very popular over the course of the last three, two to three years. So now when we turn to 2020 and some changes that have happened, the biggest changes we've seen, especially in being creative in settlements, is looking closely at the retirement accounts. And I just wanted to point out these very beneficial retirement account changes that came into play in 2020. The SECURE Act started January 1 of 2020. It does change the age that required minimum distributions are required. It used to be 70 and a half, now it's 72. So you can keep the money in these retirement funds a little longer than prior. It also allows for penalty-free withdrawals for any births or adoptions. So we do know that happens in family law cases all the time. And so you can take some money out for a birth of a new child or adoption. Certain rules apply, but it is an option to get some money out of these retirement accounts. Under the CARES Act, the Corona Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, that was probably the most popular in in the CARES Act, all kinds of benefits in this retirement account area have been opened up. So the RMDs that we talked about earlier that moved to age 72, well, for this year in particular, you don't even have to take out that money. So par parties with accounts aren't required to take anything out if they're over 70, 72 or older. So keeping the money in there and maybe splitting it out in a disproportionate way is, is a good way to get some money out without taxing. It also waives the 10% surtax or penalty for early distributions for various COVID reasons. They're typically hardship driven and in certain divorce settings when there's lack of liquidity because of the COVID, uh, we're finding a lot of folks using this particular provision to get some money out of retirement accounts now without having to pay the penalty. It also allows you to take the money out now and have a three-year delay in recognizing the income as taxable income, as well as being able to pay it back over three years. So this has been helpful in the settling cases if you need some cash. And again, because of the liquidity issues or lack of being able to find leverage or whatever the coronavirus has created in your financial world, this three-year delay of taxing or even repaying it can be a real benefit to parties who are having or struggling with some liquidity issues right now. It also has increased the limits that are allowed on retirement plan loans. So loans have been a option in some cases for taking some money out of retirement accounts uh, for settlement purposes. So all kinds of things opening up in the retirement account area in terms of helping parties settle some cases. Just a quick reminder, I call these the oldies but goodies, but there are other ways you can avoid the 10% penalty or surtax. We have always had the quadro alternative, um, a lump sum payment can be paid and avoid the 10% penalty under a quadro. And the 72 annuity option, which is also a very good technique, uh, especially if you have uh, larger or multi IRA accounts, you can split them and calculate your annuities to get the amount of money that your party needs. So there's some planning that goes along with this, but otherwise a great opportunity. Uh, and again, oldies but goodies. So with that, those are my quick settlement strategies in this COVID era. And I Appreciate you joining me, and I look forward to sharing more with you in our full session on all of these topics. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Michelle. The next session that we have is Lemonade Out of Divorce Lemons. This is presented by Lisa Ann Sharp. Uh, she is also one of our co-chairs. Thank you so much, Lisa. Lisa Sharp, and I'm here to present a hot tip today with David Stanley and Jim Varniak of BNY Mellon. Today's tip is on gifting, and it's in turning divorce lemons into gifting lemonade. Potential clients who are also considering a lifetime transfer of wealth to avoid estate taxes, certain steps can be taken now to sweeten the sour lemon of potential future changes to the lifetime, lifetime exemption limits and tax rates. Jim, what can you tell us about the current estate and gift tax exemptions? Well, I think the current tip on current estate and gift tax exemptions, in our experience, there are five pillars that when combined lead to effective management of one's wealth. The five pillars are protect, manage, invest, spend, and borrow. Today, we're focusing on protect. The Tax Cuts and Job Act, uh, or we call the Tax Act, that became effective in January 2018, roughly doubled the amount of federal estate gift and GST tax exemptions, resulting in a lifetime exemption of about 11580000 per person as of the year 2020. As a result of these changes, a married couple now has approximately $23.16 million in estate gift tax exemptions, less than any amounts that they previously used. For a high net worth individual who's already implemented gift strategies that used up most or all of their previous taxes, gift exemptions. The Tax Act gave those individuals a second chance to customize and further their wealth transfer plans. Importantly, this exemption will automatically revert to approximately 5.49 million in January of 2026 and may or may not continue to be indexed to inflation. The sunset of the scheduled increase under the Tax Act is a valuable window for using the increased tax exemption amounts. David, do you see any likely earlier changes? No, thank you, Lisa. And, and, and yes, potentially there are likely earlier changes. Uh, unfortunately, since the passage of the Tax Act, uh, the U.S. has been hit with the COVID-19 pandemic, a significant recession and continuing political turmoil. Federal, state, and local governments are spending money at extraordinary rates uh, to provide support for both the financial markets and the economy in general. Jim, it sounds like there might be a limited time frame for certain exemptions. Can I get your input on that? Yeah, I would say there's a real sense of urgency between now and here to be proactively planning. Numerous proposals from multiple parties have suggested and proposed an acceleration of the sunset, 2026 sunset, and changing the overall exemption level in the federal and state taxes. Therefore, there is no assurance that the timing of the sunset will be remain with new administration or even current administration. As such, taxpayers who expect a sizable tax under potentially lower future exemptions and tax rates should consider using their current increase exemptions by the lifetime prior to the end of 2020. David, are you seeing any other possible future tax changes beyond the lifetime 15 exemption phase out? Uh, yes, thank you, Lisa. So there are also uh, proposals that line additional potential significant restrictions on a state and gift tax planning besides simply reducing the gift to state and GST exemptions. Other potential legislative changes uh, could include restricting or eliminating valuation discounts, limiting the application of GST exemption to a maximum of 50 years, uh, eliminating crummy powers, uh, doing away with a step up in basis of death, and, and reducing the effectiveness of grant or rena uh, retained annuity trusts. These and other possible changes could have a very negative impact on the ability of wealthy taxpayers to shift wealth to future generations without incurring significant wealth transfer taxes. That's a lot of information, you two. Jim, could you summarize it for me? Sure. You know, to me, the recap is taxpayers have a short window of opportunity to take advantage of today's certainty in the current historical large gift and GST exemption amounts. In addition, incentive to act now is also supported by a recent IRS final regulation in November of 2019, confirming that there will be no clawback for gifts made under the current increase in the tax exempt amounts. 
So for us, between now and the end of the year, it's critical in terms of taking action now. David, any other input from you? Yeah, I would just echo what Jim said. And, and while no one has a crystal ball and, and we don't suggest any certainty about the results of the 2020 election, current consensus does suggest that it may be highly unlikely that taxpayers are gonna have until the end of 2025 to utilize these exemption, uh, higher exemption amounts and other tax rules. Wrap it up, it sounds like the biggest tip is take care of the estate planning now. Taxpayers should not wait and see what happens in November to begin gift planning. Part of a pre-divorce plan or even divorce planning can include a sophisticated estate plan to protect against future changes and tax increases. And please keep in mind that these changes to estate documents should always be flexible enough to account for potential changes in the future laws. Thank you both. Next up, we have COVID Proof Your Practice. Uh, this session is presented by Dan Kubet from Divorce Marketing Group. Divorce Marketing Group is our marquee marketing partner. And if you're not familiar with them, uh, I would definitely recommend reaching out to Dan uh, for insights like he's about to give us. All right, Dan, that's to you. Hi, I'm Dan Kuvret, the publisher of Family Law Magazine and the CEO of Divorce Marketing Group. I'm gonna share four tips for helping your COVID proof your practice, whether you're a family lawyer or a financial professional. Let's get started. Number one, make sure you're in regular contact with your referral sources. I don't need to tell you that we're not connecting with people like we used to. So it's imperative that you do whatever you can to stay connected to those people who can refer business to you, whether you're a family lawyer or a business evaluator or other professional serving the market. We help our family lawyer clients stay connected to their referral sources by providing them with a newsletter uh, otherwise, they wouldn't, they wouldn't stay connected because they wouldn't have the time or inclination to produce their own newsletter. If you're a financial professional, I recommend that you at least stay in touch with your contacts two, three, four, five, six times a year, and particularly now again, um, with information and resources you think would help them. If you have COVID-related information resources you can share, all the better. Number two, you need to look at how you can further enhance your reputation. This ties in with, as well, staying connected to your referral sources. And by further enhancing your reputation, what you can do now is to write articles or look at articles that you've written in the past and bring them up to date or presentations you may have done or your firm has done and bring those up to date and share that information with everybody and anybody that you know. It lets people know that you're staying on top of things, that you're actively involved in your practice. Mention, of course, that you attended this CLE event afterwards and that's the sort of information that you wanna stay top of mind with your referral sources so they know you're on top of your business. You can also create, I recommend COVID related articles now would be very popular create those and share those out with people. Um, if you do create COVID related articles that are geared to lay people, please send them to me because we'll put them up on divorcemag.com or divorcemoms.com to give you exposure to divorcing people. If those articles are geared to family lawyers, please send those to me as well because we'll put them up on Family Lawyer Magazine, which will further enhance your reputation and connect you to other professionals who you may not have gotten connected to. Number three, your website can make you look relevant or it can make you look out of date. Take a hard look at your website. If you haven't updated or redesigned your website in the past four or five years, uh, technically it's out of date. And from a visual point of view, it hasn't stayed up with what current trends are for website design. So I highly recommend that you look at a redesign of your website now. Your website should be mobile friendly so that it adapts to people looking at your website on smartphones. And now that accounts for about 75 to 80% of people are looking at websites on smartphones as opposed to desktops and laptop computers. You want to make sure that the branding on your website is the branding that you want. So if you don't have a clear brand on your website that clarifies who you are, what you do, why you do it, what differentiates you from your competitors, makes, what makes you better at um, taking care of your clients, then you should take a look at your branding message or hire a firm like Divorce Marketing Group to help you with that messaging. Because that's critical that you wanna have that message be accurate and uh, really truly reflect your firm and what you, uh, 
who you hope to attract as your clients. You also want to make sure that your photos are the best that they can possibly be. I often see horrible photos on uh, family lawyers and business evaluators websites. Get professional help and uh, align the professional with your branding message, align them with what your website looks like, etc and trust them to tell you what to wear and what position in terms of uh, where you should shoot the photo in your office or outside of your office to give you the message that you want to portray. Client reviews, absolutely critical. Make sure you have at least 10 client reviews on your website and that the reviews reflect the type of clients who you're hoping to attract and secure. Number five is add videos to your website. 80% of the people who come to the internet come to look at videos. If you're a family lawyer, you want to have question and answer videos that are geared to divorcing people so that they answer the questions that they're looking to have answered. If you're a business evaluator, you want to either gear to lay people and to family lawyers. So the questions could be more in depth if you're answering questions for family lawyers. Again, COVID related information, critical at this time. If you want to have great videos, they need to be scripted, their lighting and sound needs to be professional, and um, you need to have them professionally post-production done on them so that they look great. Lastly, talk to me. If you're looking for help to either attract or secure more clients, uh, we can help you in many ways through Divorce Marketing Group, through our websites, through our newsletters, through our podcasts, through our videos, and uh, glad to give you some guidance even if you don't choose to use our services, but I hope you do. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, the next session we have is prenuptial agreements in 2020. How an agreement, which is intended to provide certainty, survives in a world of uncertainty. Uh, that session is going to be presented by Adam John Wolf. Adam? Hello, my name is Adam Wolf. I'm an attorney in New York, a member of the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about prenuptial agreements in 2020. Prenuptial agreements are documents that are designed to plan for the future and hopefully create some certainty for the people that are signing them. In 2020, we now know more than ever that it's an uncertain world, things are constantly changing. And so we, at the conference, we'll be discussing some of the ways that prenuptial agreements have to change in order to stay pace. The first question clients are asking frequently is, will the economic impact of COVID-19 continue? When we have agreements in process, people are now aware more than ever that their future income, their future net worth, all these things are highly variable. A lot of times when we do prenuptial agreements and we try to determine how much money is going to be paid from the more money to the less moneyed spouse, we use words like income and net worth. We either say that there'll be a percentage of those uh, calculations that are paid, or maybe there's a set number, but it's subject to a cap in case of a downturn. Now, we've always advised people to be very careful how you define those terms, but now more than ever, we know how important it is to be precise so that the people implementing the agreement know what you meant by net worth. For example, are you going to be using discounts for volatility? Are you going to be using discounts for lack of marketability and other transferability concerns? Now more than ever, those things have to be brought into the consideration when you're drafting your agreement so that it's implemented the way you want it on the outside. Um, separately, we have existing agreements, agreements you've done for people in years past. Some of those clients are going to be coming to you to say, the numbers I agreed to don't make sense anymore. In this regard, we also know that in 2017, the government surprised us by making tax deductible alimony no longer tax deductible. There are agreements on the shelves of many lawyers that say there'll be taxable alimony paid from one party to the other. A lot of those people may want to be revisiting their agreements, and now is a good time to refresh yourself on what those new laws are and how they might impact the agreements that you've helped clients draft in the past and see how you may be able to help them going forward in the future. We'll explore some of those at the conference, and we will also talk about gift and estate taxes, which are often considered in prenuptial agreements and should be every single time. To set this up, I want to remind everyone that transfers to a U.S. citizen spouse have unlimited exemption from gift taxes, and transfers in most cases to U.S. citizen former spouse, meaning in a divorce, are also exempt from those gift taxes. I say most cases because if you do the agreement and wait too long to get divorced and then wait too long for the transfer, you may be outside that rule. Um, the slides have the, the section 2516 you should check to make sure you're taking advantage of that exception. 
In 2020, more than ever, with globalization, transportability of people, uh, we have a lot more U.S. citizens marrying non-citizen spouses. So you're going to need to always make sure that you ask every person signing an agreement, is there a non-citizen spouse? If so, they do not get the advantage of that unlimited marital exemption. Uh, Revenue Procedure 2019-44 states what that current limit is for those spouses. It's 157,000 in 2020. And so if you have a non-citizen spouse, any gift over 157,000 is gonna trigger a gift tax return that requires using some of your unified credit. That's gonna impact transfers during the marriage as well as the transfers under the prenuptial agreement. So you're going to need to talk about what do you plan on doing to have joint assets during the marriage or putting assets in your spouse's name and make sure that if you're above that 157 a year, you've made some recognition of the fact that there may be a gift tax consequence, even with a spouse, if it's a non-citizen spouse. Another feature that's important for prenuptial agreements in 2020 is split gift tax returns. And as We now know we've had 10 years of a provision in the Internal Revenue Code that allows a deceased spouse to port to the surviving spouse any portion of their unused unified credit. And we're not seeing that in all the prenuptial agreements that cross our desks. And sometimes it's something you have to take into account, even if the clients don't come to you with that concern. But the main big news in 2020 is the current unified credit using that same Uh, source I gave you before is $11,580,000 in 2020. And a lot of people are hearing that there may be reason to believe that that number could go down as far as zero. It's certainly unlikely to go up. So as we sit here in late 2020 and people are starting to make plans for the rest of the year, some of them may have plans to use some of that credit in 2020. Some of them may have plans to use twice that amount if they get married during the year and then give the gift before the end of the year under the split gift tax returns. So these are all things that people need to be taking into consideration. And at the conference, we'll give you some more tools on how to deal with them and serve your clients' interests. Thank you so much, Adam. The next session we have is Known or Knowable. This session is presented by James Hitchner. Uh, Jay, Jim? Hello, everybody. I'm Jim Hitchner, and I'll be presenting at the BVR AAML Divorce Conference. And one of the topics will be known or knowable and valuation dates. And this is just uh, some of my background. I'm the managing director of financial valuation advisor, CEO of valuation products and services, president financial consulting group. And then I've got a bunch of books and, and other things. But let's get right down. Uh, one of the handouts is going to be at, at uh, I'm doing two of the sessions and I'm doing BB and COVID. Uh, There's some overlap in the two sessions, but not much. And um, so when was COVID-19 known or knowable in a business valuation context? Well, I've done some research and one of the handouts we're gonna have at the conference is a a BPS, Valuation Products and Services is my firm, COVID-19 timeline. And I've done the research and I believe that COVID-19 and the effects on BV, business valuation, were known or knowable on February 24th, 2020. So you have a valuation date of February 23rd, 2020. I do not believe it was known or knowable. And one of the reasons is I looked at major worldwide events, and then I looked at three stock markets, the indexes, the Dow Jones, the S&P and the Russell 2000. And all of those, well, the Russell 2000 had its high, all time high in January. And uh, let me go to the next slide. And uh, January 16th, the Dow Jones Industrial Average had its all time high on February 12th. And the S&P 500 index had its all time high on February 19th. Now, on February 23rd to 24th, uh, President Trump asked Congress for $1.25 billion um, to re- in response to coronavirus. The U- U.S. had 35 cases at that point in time, no deaths. However, that day, Monday, 224.20, the Dow Jones Industrial Average had 
the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped a thousand points, the worst in two years. Fears virus will weaken economy. Then on Tuesday, the S&B 500 in one day went down three percent, and the um, and then the uh, Russell 2000 over a two-day period went down close to six percent. And uh, so that's why I believe it was known or knowable because I'm looking at the stock market. And again, you can see in red, you can see what was going on in these three indexes, particularly when the U.S. just started getting cases, although no deaths. The stock market reacted, in general, reacted very unfavorably. And I'm going to go through that so, so you can fully understand it. The other thing is I was on a task force by the AICPA and they put out a subsequent event toolkit with recommendations. And some of the questions that um, we're going to answer when we, when we do this uh, panel, can evaluation analysts disclose a subsequent event in evaluation report? Of course they can. There, here's the one thing though, there's no requirement to do it. It's up to the individual valuation analyst to determine whether they want to do a subsequent event. For example, if I'm doing a valuation as of February 1st and I'm not considering COVID, I am going to put in a section on a subsequent event stating that uh, I did not value this uh, with, with knowledge know that where COVID-19 was known or knowable. Do you have to disclose a subsequent event? No. Um, what's the purpose of the valuation analyst disclosing subsequent events? What's your professional and ethical requirements? We're going to go over those. Uh, whether you have to explain why you decided to disclose the event. Uh, what's the appropriate format or language and illustrations? That toolkit has several um, templates for format and language and disclosures. So I'm using the, um, the, the ones um, in this toolkit, this AICPA subsequent event. Uh, toolkit. And then, you know, the definition and um, what kind of information you'll use. And then there's some, I've got um, some opinions on when publicly traded company SEC filings would be known or knowable and whether you can use information that's after the valuation date, but as of the valuation date. So I hope you come and listen to us. Um, uh, the uh, And uh, I'll see you soon, I hope. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. The next session that we have is the DCF method. Uh, this is presented by Ron Tignor. Ron, uh, go ahead and tell us about the DCF method in the world of divorce today. Hello, folks. My name is Ron Sr. I'm a CPA business analyst based in uh, Denver, Colorado. And I wanted to give you a, a brief preview of a session that I will be doing together with uh, two colleagues, Daryl Feldman and Drew Shoshnik at the National Divorce Conference. Uh, we're really excited to present this topic. The title is Myths and Realities of the Discounted Cash Flow Method in Family Law. Uh, I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about kind of what this is and why we think it's important to lift this up. And I'm going to skip through a few of the slides here that we'll be presenting from. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the theory that when we're valuing a business, the value of any investment is equal to the sum of the present value of the future economic benefits expected to be produced by the owner of those, those benefits of that interest. Um, back in 1904, uh, a justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, Oliver Wendell Holmes, indicated in an opinion, all values are anticipation of the future. So whether we're using an a income approach to value a business or a market approach or even an asset approach, it's all based on what are the future economic values and what would an, an investor be willing to pay for those future anticipated economic benefits. The premise of our presentation is that a single period capitalization earnings model, which has been widely used and accepted in family law courts, uh, the courts that I've been in for, for decades, is essentially the same conceptually as a discounted 
future economic benefits method when you have more than one future economic period. And the primary difference is the assumption on future growth. A single period capitalization method utilizes an assumption of constant future growth where a, a discounted future benefits method uh, or discounted cash flow often called is where we take multiple future periods and discount those back to present value. And that's the premise that we're saying is that it's appropriate to use those multi future periods in a DCF model or a discounted future cash flow model in family law courts. And I'm going to explain why we think that's appropriate. The myth is that it's it's inappropriate to do that because those future earnings are the earnings of the property spouse and it's inappropriate in equitable distribution in family law matters to consider the future earnings of the property spouse. spouse. The reality is if you properly apply what we call a discounted future benefits or often discounted cash flow, it's appropriate to use. And why is that? Uh, it, because if we properly normalize out reasonable compensation for the owner employee, that property spouse that owns the business, and we're only looking at what's left over after a deduction of the reasonable compensation for the property spouse in those future periods, what we're discounting back to present value is the profit of the enterprise above and beyond reasonable compensation for that property spouse. The reason why we think this is important for uh, judicial officers and family law practitioners to understand is that COVID-19 has essentially made uh, the single period model unreliable. Trying to figure out constant future growth in today's world is just not happening because so many businesses and so many uh, industries have been disrupted to the point where we're going to have to project out what this business is going to be capable of doing like a startup business in a whole new industry in a whole new economic environment. So if you properly normalize out those earnings, what you're left with is the cash flow of the profits of the enterprise. And if you properly discount those back to present value, it's a proper way to value an interest for a dissolution of marriage proceeding. I know that's a, a lot of numbers and a lot of financial theory. We're going to explore this in greater detail in the session that we're going to be doing at the National Divorce Conference. So we hope you're able to join us and uh, we look forward to, to being with you in the, in the virtual conference that we'll be presenting at. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ron. Next, we're going to dive into spreadsheets uh, with a segment by Richard West on equitable distribution spreadsheets. Hi, my name is Richard West. I'm from Orlando, Florida. I'm really excited to be here today as part of the joint AML BVR presentation. I'm going to be talking to you today about comparative equitable distribution spreadsheets. Almost every state has some form of sheet like this. Some places call it marital balance sheets, others call it equitable distribution spreadsheets. This particular one is uh, used commonly in the Ninth Circuit here in Orlando, Florida. And I'm going to show you the layout of the sheet real quick. If you can see my cursor down at the bottom, this is all written in Excel and there's a number of tabs. We're now on the getting started tab. The next is the case style where you would enter the uh, information, your case number, name, date of marriage, date of filing, who the petitioner is, who the respondent is. The next sheet is our asset entry sheet. We're going to come back to this in a couple of minutes. Uh, and then you, uh, you can see on this sheet here that you have various categories, real property, accounts, retirement, pre-retirement, business interest, personal property, etc. And then we have another sheet another tab to add in some miscellaneous if they're not there. This is the note sheet, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, and then you have a separate entry sheet for liabilities, miscellaneous liabilities, the notes, and then the summary. And we're going to finish up with this summary sheet. This is controlled, if not on the sheet itself, by the settings page. Most of what you do to manipulate what you will be working with uh, is found here on, on layout, print, different tools that we'll use, input and output, and some review options. 
So <clears throat> as in any other time, we'd identify what case we're talking about here on this screen, and then we go to the assets page. The way this is set up, and I've got the screen locked right now so you can continue to see the categories, is <clears throat> you have the classifications here, in the next two columns, you have who owns it or possesses it or how it's titled, and uh, then the description of what the particular asset is here. If I take it back up to the top, you see it starts with, with uh, real property and then bank accounts. Here's the court's work. Uh, give this to the court and they'll be able to determine what findings they make on the value and which party they're going to distribute it to. This section here, entitled Valuation, has two columns for the husband's opinion of value and the dates upon which that value occurs, and the wife's here. And then the final big columns are the husband's proposed distribution and the wife's proposed distributions. And like any other spreadsheet, when you drop down to the bottom, and this is infinitely... Uh, uh, you can add to it infinitely, but when you get down to the bottom, there's going to be totals. It's going to total for you automatically. So <clears throat> I've got a few assets added in here, but if, for example, there was another piece of property, you would just click the Add button, and you would put in one, two, three, Dumb Lane. And you would put in whatever the date it was valued of. The husband's valuation might be $230,000. And the wife may have a different opinion. And she says, because she wants to keep it, no, it's only worth $190,000. And <clears throat> then who, who is the proposed distribution to? The husband proposes it goes to the wife at this number. And you can just simply copy and paste. You say, OK, and it goes in the wife's column. On the wife's distribution, she may want to put it in at 190000 So again, just copy and paste. And if, but if the wife's idea is that it be split evenly, she could put in here $85,000. Well, it's supposed to automatically calculate. That's probably user error, and I apologize for that. If you want to make a note to the uh, court, you can simply put in you highlight the, where you want to have the note, you hit this little back and forth key, and it takes you to the notes section, and you know we're under wife, so we want to add a row, and we say OK, and we say 230,000, this number is too high. So you get the idea. And to go, to go back, all you got to do is click here, and you're back. Cancel. Back to assets. The fact that it's highlighted in blue tells you there is a note. The rest of the entry happens exactly the same way. You would do the same thing for liabilities and notes. If you want to move something up or down, for example, in, in your list, all you have to do is click on it up or down arrow, it moves the asset where you want it. You have drop down boxes here for husband or wife or joint, and it's all very, very simple. Now here's where the power of it comes in. <clears throat> if I'm representing the wife and I have filled in the wife's um, values and proposed distributions, and the husband's attorney has filled that in, now I go to the settings menu, and I choose input um, and output import file. This will only import XLSM files or CSV files. Generally speaking, we want to merge with existing data so both of them come in. So if I click on the merge and I say import file, 
yes. And <clears throat> I'm sorry, I thought I had this set up where I wanted it on the desktop. Here's the husbands. I double click on that, and you see it'll take just a moment. It's now moving into the notes section, the other uh, miscellaneous assets and liabilities. And when the entire sheet is populated, we're simply going to move now. Well, I'll give you a quick look at this and see. You can see before. We only had things in the, in the wife's column. Now we have them in both with proposed distributions. Again, you drop down to the bottom. Here's the various opinions of value. According to the uh, wife's valuation, there's about a million four three nine, husband a million and a half. And here's the proposed distributions. When we go to summary, it shows a summary of the total assets and total liabilities as spoken about by each and what the equalizing payment would be. If the assets were left according to the wife's plan, she would have to pay the husband $334,000. According to the husband's proposed distribution, he would keep certain other assets, and $245,000 would come from the wife to the husband. That's a quick demonstration of this. We plan on showing you some other very usable and interesting spreadsheets at our seminar in September, and I certainly hope you will be there to join us. Pleasure to see you, even virtually. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Looks, uh, the next session that we have is Managing Client Expectations in Uncertain Times, COVID Impact on Process by Jim Godbout. Hi, my name is Jim Godbout, and I'm a principal at CLA uh, in their evaluation and forensic group. The topic that uh, we're going to be covering in, in our presentation is managing client expectations in, in these uncertain times. Um, I'm going to talk a couple of, of minutes here related to, again, COVAC, uh, COVID and impact on process, as well as on business valuations. Um, what we've been seeing, and, and I'm sure that you probably have seen this in your local jurisdictions, is uh, clients have become more anxious than, than they were earlier on in this year. When COVID struck, uh, in, I'd, I'd say March of this year, I think everyone kind of took a step back and, and you know, took a pause. And from that standpoint, March, April, I think everybody was, was still just understanding what was going on. So things had really been put on hold. In the last couple months, I think things have uh, become much more anxious for the clients. They want to know are their cases going forward, uh, what's taking so long, how is this process going to look like going forward, how do we adapt? So some of the things that we're going to talk about in our presentation is trying to get the clients uh, to understand what's going on and trying to manage their expectations in this time of uncertainty. A lot of cases are taking longer through the court system. Um, at least here in, in my jurisdiction, which is in the uh, Chicagoland area, um, courts, uh, some courts are, are finally starting to go in person. Other courts are still using Zoom or some type of video chat. But long and short is a lot of cases are getting, I'll say, over here kicked down the road. So cases are likely to take a lot longer in the court system than they had in the past. And that's probably one of the things to, to really kind of start trying to manage the client's expectations on. Chances are this is going to be a little bit longer process than it would normally, or at least uh, as of last year. So what I see a lot of people doing is, is trying to think about options outside of court, whether it's uh, alternative dispute resolution, whether it's mediation or cooperative type settings where, you know, we're getting on the, and using these video chats as is kind of a, um, a kind of a mediation type session, even if a formal mediator isn't taking part, to talk about what's going on, perhaps maybe with the business or what's going on with income determinations. Uh, how do you manage that, that stuff? I'm seeing a lot more attorneys come up with creative settlement structures where perhaps they try to get the, the case settled without doing a formal valuation. Maybe there's a look back provision. Uh, maybe there's a formulaic type approach 
But in general, um, I think attorneys have been getting much more creative in terms of settlement structures. In terms of COVID's impact on business valuations, you know, the valuation process is, is an art and, and a science. It's a, it's a merger. The science obviously is, is from a mathematical standpoint, but the art requires a lot of pro professional opinion calls, a lot of subjective calls, which typically the more subjective calls uh, could lead to more disputes. So what's going to happen and how do you handle this? Again, trying to manage that client's expectation is chances are it's going to take more time. It's going to take more time for the process for the divorce. It's going to take more time to complete a valuation and costs are likely going to be higher than they had in the past. And again, it's not something that anybody wants to hear. So it's, it's important to be upfront and try to start managing expectations from, from a client's perspective on these cases. In terms of more subjective calls, I'll touch upon that just here for a second, is that from a valuation perspective, people, uh, evaluators have to deal with a lot more variables and dispersion of variables than they had in the beginning of this year. One of the big factors in any valuation is trying to determine what normalized cash flow is. And oftentimes, uh, somebody would look at the past as a relative indicator as to what the future holds. Obviously, the world is completely different this year um, and started at in you know February, March of this year as to everything becoming more uncertain. So how does somebody make those subjective calls these days? Do they have a reasonable basis to make those types of subjective calls are all important things that people are going to have to uh, expect and learn how, how to uh, handle. Whether it's an industry uh, or um, maybe it's a, uh, is it a short-term effect? Is it a long-term effect on the industry? That's gonna play a part. Uh, is the business going to come back? Uh, what is it going to look like in terms of forecasts? How are people putting this information? How do they put forecasts together? Uh, it's, a, it's hard to get industry information and forecasts today because of so much uncertainty. So what are some options? How do you handle that? The other component in terms of the valuation that I think you may see is increases in, in discounts for lack of marketability, because I think there's liquidity issues that uh, are possibly out there depending on the business. Uh, some businesses may have a harder time uh, trying to sell these days. Some businesses may have a harder time trying to get financing. Uh, those are potential liquidity issues that again, didn't they, while they existed, they didn't exist to the extent that they uh, do today. So how are those things going to be handled? We'll, we'll go over that in much more detail in our detailed presentation. Um, so we hope that you join us. All right, thank you so much, Jim. The next, the next session is application of discounts in divorce cases as opposed to applications of discounts in compulsory business transactions. Uh, this session is by Andrew Stoshnik. Drew, go ahead. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mission Critical in Divorce. Glad to be able to present to you a topic that's a bit on the obscure, but also one that's vitally important as we deal with precedential value in our matrimonial cases. And that deals with the ever-evolving world of application of discounts in divorce cases. Now, most of us are considering discounts for lack of control, discounts for lack of marketability, and wondering about what the IRS range is, what the average is, what the professional judgment of our valuation experts will be. But sometimes we overlook the obvious with our legal training, and that is what type of precedent is there and are there distinctions between subject matter areas for valuations and valuation discounts being applied in divorce cases? And one of those differences is in a, the issue of a going concern in a divorce case, which is frequently what we see in compulsory business transactions. Again, there's discretion within the professional judgment of our experts to look at both IRS ranges, industry ranges. You'll often hear about rules of thumb. And again, the term professional judgment that I've used a couple of times, you'll hear from your experts repeatedly because it's within their sound discretion and their training. One of the things, however, that is not within professional judgment is the issue that precedes that. And that is, how do we know what our standards are legally to apply 
and to help guide our experts in the valuation process. There are distinctions between the type of transactions that we see. First and foremost, in disillusion cases, you will frequently find that there is not a sale of the business. It's known as a going concern. It is a business or a professional practice that's operating and that will continue to operate post-divorce. That's quite different from a compulsory tra transaction. And let's talk about the compulsory transaction first so we can draw that distinction. A compulsory transaction is largely a compelled return of ownership interests. You see it frequently in the medical profession where physicians are told that they must sell a portion of their practice or an interest in a surgery center or a hospital. There's typically a shareholder agreement or a controlling operating agreement. You'll often find that there are buyback provisions or provisions that talk about methodology, methodologies for calculating values. These are what's known as closed and ready-made markets. It's a compelled transaction. There's no discretion as to whether or not to sell unless there is ancillary litigation. The purpose behind these types of transactions and the purpose behind how discounts are treated in this situation is to prevent windfall to a controlling party or a majority interest party. You'll find that many states have statutes. Many states have cases that have developed these issues. And we will look at one case example that shows the dichotomy in just a moment. But typically you will find that there may be a standard of value expressed in the statutes and the cases. You may find that there is a provision as to whether or not discounts can or should be applied. That differs greatly from what we find in an equitable proceeding or a quasi-equitable proceeding, such as a divorce case, that have mixed questions of law or fact. There we deal with broad discretions of courts. There's often no sale of ownership interests. Rather than having a closed and ready-made market, there is no market because it's a going concern. There is the hypothetical transaction. We've all heard of IRS rule, revenue ruling 59. 60, which deals with the fair market value definition. And that revenue ruling, when you look at it, is helpful in divorce cases. It may not be helpful in a compulsory transaction. Statutory provisions often do exist. And what you will find is that many times the concept of fair value is the standard of value to be applied in compulsory transactions versus fair market value which is frequently applied in the disillusion context or what the hypothetical willing buyer will pay the hypothetical willing seller. These statutes and cases that underlie the statutes may address the application or non-application of discounts. And again, most frequently we'll deal with discounts for lack of control because you're dealing with in most cases or many cases at least, a lack of a controlling interest or a majority interest and then discount for lack of marketability. You have to be careful in applying precedent. If you apply precedent that deals with a compulsory or a closed market transaction and try and analogize those cases to what is known as a going concern or open market transaction, such as is existent in most divorce cases, the application can easily be distinguished by your adversary and can set you up, your client up, as well as your expert up for issues. And there's one case study that would be a great example that while not applicable in all jurisdictions has a very clear statement as to how this applies. The distinction is Alexander versus Alexander versus Hartman versus Big Inch Fabricators and Construction Holding Company. 10 years apart from the Indiana Court of Appeals, these cases are distinctive in their analyses in these regards. Alexander was a divorce case. It dealt with a business, not a professional practice, but the principles would be the same. In this instance, there was a question as to whether or not discounts for lack of marketability would be applied. The Indiana Court of Appeals expressly said that yes, in equitable proceedings where there is a going concern and no exchange of ownership interests, the discount for lack of marketability as well as indicta lack of control would apply. Alexander is a clear and express opinion that in the disillusion case, you look at the hypothetical transaction and you have the ability to apply the open market discounts. 
Contrast that one decade later and just recently in May of this year with Hartman versus Big Inch Fabricator. Hartman was a non-divorce case. It dealt with a business interest and a shareholder agreement. Hartman owned a minority interest in the business. Hartman, when he was forced or compelled to tender his interest as he was leaving the company under circumstances, was forced to sell. The company undertook a valuation under the methodology prescribed under the operating agreement as well as the shareholder agreement. When the company did the valuation, they applied discounts for both lack of control and lack of marketability and took a $3.5 million interest down to a much lower $2.4 million or so interest value of the interest in this case. The Indiana Court of Appeals reversed summary judgment on this issue and said in these transactions, the open market concept didn't apply. It didn't apply for several reasons. One, there was a statute, and that statute laid out prescriptions as to what can and can't be done when there is a closed market transaction in the sale of a business interest. Two, discounts for lack of marketability and lack of control would provide a windfall to the company in terms of the buyback under the shareholder agreement because, in fact, Hartman benefited from the bargain that he made, which was to sell his interest back without discounts in a closed and ready-made market. The Indiana Court of Appeals took great distinction to footnote the difference between Hartman and the Alexander case, and also harken back to an opinion from 2002 in which the predicate was laid for this distinction that is now expressly shown. The Indiana Appellate Court is not different from many courts in many jurisdictions. Again, many states have statutes, Many states have case authority, and many states will distinguish between fair value and fair market value, both in the open and closed market concept and in the distinction between disillusion cases and non-divorce cases. So be very careful when you look to apply precedent in your arguments and contentions as to whether discounts can be applied. Not all cases are equal, not all cases are equitable, and most importantly, not all discounts are the same. All right, it looks like we're running a little bit close to time, but I wanted to uh, make sure we gave time to Andy Dezamba. He's the executive editor here at BVR, and he's gonna go and kind of sum things up with uh, insights from six months of leading coverage from BVR on COVID-19. Take it away, Andy. Well, hello everyone, and uh, my name is Andy Dezamba, and I'm the uh, executive editor here at uh, BVR. And uh, kind of as the title uh, says, um, we're going to just look back uh, into six months of uh, BBR's coverage of uh, COVID-19. Uh, so let's just get right into it. Um, we really started covering this uh, back in March, March 11th, as you can see. These are just some very uh, few highlights of our coverage. Um, and we cover it through various... Um, e-zines and I'll go through those but uh, uh, initially we were kind of just getting some uh, uh, early thoughts and advice uh, we uh, polled our editorial advisory board um, and uh, got some thoughts so we were publishing that in March uh, some of those thoughts are still very valid so you know feel free to go back uh, BB wire is on our website it's a free e-zine it comes out every week uh, we've had ongoing coverage of this topic so you can go in there look at past issues and get all of this uh, 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 caught up to date. Uh, early on, we were getting a lot of questions about how to deal with December 31 valuations. So we did some back and forth on that in April. Uh, that's pretty much a settled matter. Um, kind of uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, there was no impact uh, to be shown um, for this particular person's question, um, but uh, needed to be covered in subsequent events uh, commentary. Um, we have another uh, e-zine called the BB Law Alert, which comes out every month, and we talk about legal aspects um, of uh, valuation. And of course, that publication has been covering COVID-19. We did some material in April on uh, disruption and damages, so I'll go through more of that later. Uh, in May, uh, we covered an interesting topic about a COVID-19 premium. Uh, should you uh, uh, layer in uh, a special premium. And what came up was in, in uh, 08 and 09, during the uh, 
uh, uh, that uh, time, um, a 20% distress premium was being used by a number of uh, experts. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. And we followed up on that idea with an article in our business valuation update, which is a, a monthly publication, subscription publication. Uh, Ron Sr. did a, a very interesting article on uh, that exact thing, uh, assessing the additional risk. And it was a kind of a framework of thinking with a checklist of questions to kind of help you uh, flesh that out. Um, we're also getting a lot of questions about business interruption. Um, and uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, and it's on the next slide, uh, July 29th, we covered the first significant case uh, having to do with uh, COVID-19 business interruption. Um, it was not good news for businesses. Uh, essentially, the court dismissed uh, the case. Um, the virus did, uh, the ruling was the virus did not cause any physical damage, which generally uh, is a requirement for business interruption policies. So uh, we'll be doing ongoing coverage of that as developments uh, uh, continue. Uh, we have a publication also called BB Wire uh, UK, uh, United Kingdom, where we cover uh, valuation matters from that uh, standpoint. That's a bi monthly. Uh, in August, we, there was some coverage on a webinar uh, with uh, some global evaluation experts talking about the impact. And uh, it's kind of a general theme that, uh, you know, the market is so uh, much in turmoil. The best alternative is a more rigorous DCF. Uh, that's been a theme throughout our coverage. Um, also in August, um, we covered uh, the NACFA conference, which took place online. Uh, and uh, again, speakers were talking about uh, the income approach and in particular uh, that uh, the uh, capitalized cash flow method, method has been largely abandoned in, in favor of the DCF. Uh, and then in the newsletter, we did some more in-depth coverage of the NACFA conference. Of course, a lot of it was uh, COVID-19 related. And so we had some of that in our business valuation update. Uh, we do continuing coverage, uh, of course, um, every week and every month. Uh, the next issue of this uh, business valuation update has a very interesting uh, uh, case of a valuation firm helping a client determine whether uh, he should reopen his business or keep it shuttered. Uh, so there's a very interesting uh, case study on that. Um, kind of the overall theme uh, that we, we kind of see and to sum up all of this um, uh, details of all of the uh, coverage we have is kind of boiled down into this which is um, kind of go back to basics, uh, look to the fundamentals of business valuation um, in, your, in your analysis. Um, use your own best judgment, which is uh, very important, and recognize that things will change as the pandemic uh, evolves and then act accordingly. And then most importantly, reach out to your peers. Everyone's in the same boat. Uh, everyone is learning, network with your colleagues, read, uh, read, read. Uh, there's lots of material coming out uh, from us and other entities from the VPOs. Um, uh, so read all you can, attend webinars and conferences, and um, uh, that will certainly uh, help uh, uh, meet these challenges of today. Uh, I put in some links. Uh, we have a COVID-19 resource page at BBR. Uh, there's a link also there to sign up for our free e-zines. Um, and uh, I hope this was uh, very helpful to you. Watch our ongoing coverage. Uh, we're constantly attending webinars, conferences, and speaking with experts to get their insights. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you at the uh, virtual divorce conference that starts September 9. Uh, thanks again and have a great day.